Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to The Law. This is your legal light. It is your health law. I'm Samson Ladia Nyanini, and we're continuing our uh, legal clinic, our education on injunctions, how to avoid contempt of court. My guests, who were here, yes, uh, on Sunday, return today for the second installment. And today, we'll make sufficient time so you can call in and get direct platinum legal advice. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. In the context of, of court or legal proceeding, it may operate, it may have two meanings. It's not only an injunction is a term that is used in the court process, not only to restrain somebody, but sometimes an injunction, so an injunction could be prohibitive or mandatory in the sense that you are asking somebody to do something or it could be used that do not do something so it may have two sides of, of, of the sort it could direct an act to be done or it could restrain an act from being done so a court will grant an injunction we say in law to preserve the status quo anti before litigation that, that's so an interlocutory I, injunction yes so i found a case against bobby and like you rightly explained we are litigating over a parcel of land that nobody is supposed to do anything that will change the circumstances of the land or the action is pending once you are served with an application for injunction restraining you from undertaking an act then you would have to hold on until that application for injunction is heard. The reason is that per Article 125 of the 1992 Constitution, judicial power is vested solely in the judiciary. And so if there are disputes between parties, it is only the judiciary that can determine it. It's an, it's an advice from us to the public out there. It's actually a compulsion also by law that once you are served with an application for injunction, the law behoves on you to stop whatever you are doing. And um, like my, my, my colleague said, it is out of respect to the court. And if you do any act, that tends to undermine the authority of the court. That amounts to contempt. So, 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 so you are taking a risk which you could be punished for. Exactly. Exactly. You could be punished for contempt. Once there's evidence that you are aware of the pendency of the application, yes, you decided to disregard. You're welcome back. And my guest, Bobby Banson, is a law lecturer and author of legal text right here in the studio with us today. Thank you for making the time to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so very much for the sacrifice. Albert Jeffy is also a law lecturer and author of legal text. Albert, thank you once again for making the time to be with us. Please unmute your mic. Yeah, thank you, Samson, for having me. Great, great, great. Right, so we have had tons of commendations coming our way uh, for what you two gentlemen did last week in explaining the law down to earth, simplified for people to understand, and also to leave people without any confusion and any ambiguity as to the question when you are served with a prohibitory process or an injunctive process from the court, an application, whether you are stopped immediately until it is determined or you are not and you can decide to do what you may. We obviously found the need to continue this part two for the good reason that there are certain cases that certain lawyers have referred to and on the basis of that, they state that when you are served with an application for injunction, it is not a court order, it is not a judgment. And to that effect, you, your hands are not sort of tied or stayed from taking a step. So let's try and understand that from that angle. 
I'll begin, begin with you, Albert. Um, so I'll begin by asking that you confirm and you do not intend to vary or change anything from what you said last week, correct? <laughs> yes, yes. I still, I still stand by what I said last week. Okay. And recast in brief, even though we played back a bit of it, recast in brief what your position is to when someone is served with an application for injunction, what they can or cannot do, and what the potential consequences may be. All right, so uh, what I said last week was that when you are served with an application for injunction, you are required to maintain the status quo pending the final determination of the application. And what I explained by status quo is that the circumstances of the issues at the time. If it is a building that you are developing, wherever stage the building has got into, you hold on into whatever was prevailing at the time of the service of the injunction and wait for the court to determine it before you proceed further. If you act contrary to that, that amounts to undermining the integrity of the court, that under amounts to interference with the administration of justice, and they can be cited and punished for contempt of court. That was my position last week. Thank you very much. Bobby, once again, thank you for making the time to be in the studio. What, for you, will be your brief sum of your position, as far as the law is concerned, on when you are served with an application for injunction from the court, not an order, not a judgment of the court? Well, um, like um, Albert said, um, the whole idea is to ensure that you do not constitute yourself into uh, judicial authority for determining the outcome mm. of that process that had been served on you. And so if the application, the reliefs that are endorsed on that motion paper are very express and unambiguous as to what they are seeking the court to restrain you from doing, it is best that you stay whatever you are doing, you suspend your activities towards the, mo the reliefs that have been endorsed on the motion paper and give the court the chance to either grant the application or refuse the application. If there is enough basis for the application to be granted, the court will do so on terms as the court will deem fit. Right. If there is no basis for the court to grant the injunction, the court will refuse the injunction and compensate you for whatever you would have lost by staying your hands in damages. So it is not as if you will not have any remedy. You will definitely have a remedy. So why do you then take the law into your own, own hands, as it were, when there would be a remedy for you if the application is refused? Thank you very much. Now I'm going to read a small portion of a case that has been referred to many times together with one other case, and then we'll come uh, to a certain perspective. In this matter, the court said, and I'm reading quite a bit of it, that the second point raised under the first ground of appeal was that the mere filing of an application for interim injunction was not sufficient reason to debar a chief from performing the functions of the office as held by the trial court. Counsel for the respondent, was of the view that if the chief was not restrained automatically upon being served with an application for interim injunction, he may alienate stool property so that by the time the motion is finally disposed of, he might have dis dissipated most of the stool properties. At the court below, the respondent's counsel relied on the case of ex parte alote, the full title and citation of that case is Republic versus Moffat and others, ex parte Alote, 1971. And we have read it to you so many times to say that once an application is filed, you stop. You don't take a step. If you take a step, you'll be punished for contempt. It seems it is this authority, this is the court speaking, it seems it is this authority that has been relied upon for the argument that once a person has been served with an application for interim injunction, he must cease performing the act for which the application has been brought, else he is automatically guilty of contempt. 
I think it's about time we put such arguments and belief to rest. That case did not, in the first place, purport to lay down any hard and fast rule that a person served with an application for interim injunction commits contempt of court if he does that very act for which the application has been brought. Moreover, the court was careful in emphasizing the point that it was only conduct that was likely to bring the administration of justice into disrepute or interfere with any pending litigation that was contempt of court. In that case, the court came to that conclusion because of the fact that before the application could be heard, the very act for which the application had been brought to prohibit had been performed. How do we move on from here? Well, because, I mean, it's yes. the Esparti Perku case. Right. Um, I, yes. And I would want us to situate mm. it in the proper context. Right. So the case I just read, a portion of which I just read to you, is the Republic versus Nana Kru Peko the second, ex party Nana John Ezoa. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Peko case. Okay. Now every ratio, as lawyers know, must first be situated in the context of the case, and sometimes it is true as lawyers. Um, like they say, no matter how thin you slice a bread, there will be, always be two sides. So a law two lawyers can have different interpretation and application of a particular case. Mm. But at the end of the day, you must read the ratio as a whole. Now, you would see that the emphasis of this ratio, and I, I believe it's a court of appeal decision by Benin J. That's right. Is that you do not say that the mere fact that somebody has been served with an application for contempt does not mean that the person is restrained from doing what the person, the application for contempt is seeking the person to do. Mm. Last week, I emphasized that the reliefs that are endorsed on the application for contempt is very key. Right. Second, whether or not the conduct of that person will be deemed to have taken away the judicial authority that Article 125 puts in the court. Now, what did the application for contempt in the Perko case seek to do? Mm -hmm. In the Perko case, the applicant, the person who has applied for contempt, filed an application for interim injunction, which in the context of the Chieftaincy Act was allowed, not, they don't use the word interlocutory right. then, by that law, I think 1970 law. Now, they said that they want an order to restrain the person from acting as a chief. Now, there are two different things. Mm -hmm. In the Alote case, the Mofat, the judge said that the application was to prevent them from out outdooring him as a chief. And this Perku case was to restrain him from acting as a chief. Now, if you read the entire case, you see that the case itself was dismissed. The original case was dismissed because they only filed a statement of case without adding a rate of summons. So the court first said, your rate itself is, is defective. We won't cure it. So your interim injunction application itself, mm -hmm. you can't put something or nothing and expect it to stand. Right. Be that as it may, under the Chieftaincy Act, and the, if you go further in that ratio, they made reference to it. Unlike the normal causes of action, in the normal course of action, we know that an, filing an appeal, a notice of appeal, does not operate as a stay of execution. We all agree right. that under an other civil procedure, if you file a notice of appeal, it does not operate as a stay of execution. However, in the Chieftaincy Act under that law, that time, if the House of Chiefs ruled that somebody is disqualified from being a chief, and that ruling came after the person has been installed as a chief. Once the person files a notice of appeal, it operates as a stay, which is different from what we know. Okay. Now, what is the reason for that? Mm. Because they believe that there is the public interest that you do not want a vacuum mm. in the chieftaincy affairs of a particular people. Right. And so if you say that at, at a point in time there is no chief at all, you are leaving room for chaos. Mm -hmm. And last week, you remember I mentioned that in an application for injunction, even if you prove a legal interest or an equitable interest, the court will look at the balance of convenience. 
to see if it is equitable, mm. looking at the facts of this case. So the court refused or refused the application for contempt, to commit for contempt in this case, because they said your application for interim injunction was seeking an order to restrain the man from acting as a chief. He was already He chief. had already been installed. In and the, so what in the are, Aloto case, he was about to, to be, be outdoor. Yes. <laughs> so that is the difference. Mm. And so, and, and, and Albert made that point, mm. that once you are served in an application for injunction, the status quo must be maintained. And so if at the time you file the application for injunction, the person was already instilled as a chief, and you are saying that you want him to be restrained from carrying out his duties or from acting as a chief, you are not asking for a reversal of the instrument process, mm -hmm. then you are leaving a gap because he's been instilled. Yes. So the, it's not as if the jassy can act because so, there's... An so the court said to maintain the status quo, he was a chief. Yes. So he stays as a chief. As a chief. Until the application for injunction has been determined. Yes. Thank you. Unfortunately, <laughs> in that case, everything was struck out. Now, let me just mm. give this analogy. Right. I, last week, I used the example of the house, you and I right. litigating over mm. a land. Mm -hmm. If you had finished constructing the house mm. and you were staying in the house and I filed an application to restrain you from trespassing onto my land, mm -hmm. does it mean that by that application you cannot go into your house? That was the question that the judges, in another way, were asking in this Perko case. Mm. Because as, at the time I filed the application for injunction, you had already completed the building, you were living there. Okay. So if I serve you an application for injunction, asking for an order to restrain you from trespassing onto my land, it means in effect what I'm asking the court to do is to prevent you from going home when you close from work. That is not the purpose of injunctions. Mm. It is an equitable relief. And so it cannot be used to achieve an end that is contrary to law. Right. And the, in the National Lotteries Authority, the Supreme Court said that a court cannot grant an application for injunction that defeats a statute. Okay. And so in the Perkun case, the interim application for injunction, if it was granted by the court, would have defeated the Chieftaincy Act. Right. That was why the court distinguished the cases mm. and said, do not make a generalized position that in this particular instance, there is a specific statute that preserves the status quo of a chief, even when he files a notice of appeal, which is different from all the ordinary causes of actions that we practice, or the procedures we know. Thank you very much. And on the same matter, we will come and refer to what others have said, that that is why they say if an application for injunction is filed and served on you, and you go ahead and do the thing that the application is trying to stop you from doing before the application is heard, you may not be liable for contempt because it is only an application. It is not a court order. And for example, people read uh, Ex Participo and they say the court set out grounds. One, that there must be a judgment or order requiring the person to do or abstain from doing something. Two, that it must be shown that the person knew what precisely was expected of them to do or to abstain from doing. And three, that it must be shown that the person failed to comply with the terms of the judgment or, or the order. And that uh, that disobedience was willful. And some say, unless you can establish that this has happened, you can't say somebody can be, cite, uh, can be uh, in contempt of the court simply by an application before the court. We we'll, would we'll come to that proper. Albert, how do you use this case to explain to anybody that your position is what the law affirms? You mean the expertise in the case? No, the um, Nana Krupeku case. All right. So, so like our copy said, mm -hmm. that case is supposed to be treated as an exemption rather than as a rule. And I, I will say this, that that particular case 
has not been followed by any court. There is no judicial precedent, apart from this case, where someone has been served with an application for an injunction, he has gone to do the very act that is uh, the application seeks the injunction, and the court had allowed him to go on spot free. So if you are a lawyer and you rely on this case to advise a client to proceed with what he is doing after he has been served with an application for an injunction, you are putting yourself at a risk. Number two, this is a court of appeal decision. It is not the decision of the Supreme Court. And as such, this decision does not override earlier decisions pronounced upon by the Supreme Court. Right. Last week, I took time to run us through some cases of the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court has emphatically said, if you are aware and go ahead to do the very act that you are, sick, you are, you are, you are to be prohibited, it amounts to content. And lawyers will tell you, where a decision of a court of appeal conflicts with the decision of the Supreme Court, the decision of the Supreme Court prevails. Number three is that the purpose for which you are to stop the very act you are doing upon being served with an application for an injunction is to preserve the status quo. Like Bobby Bansi really stated, the status quo at the time the application for interim injunction was served on the chief was that he was a chief. So preserve the status quo means wait for it to be determined and whatever is happening should continue. So right. if he's a chief, he has to continue to perform his duties mm. now, as a chief. Right. So hold on. What you just said, this is what the court said in very plain way. You have actually said it, but let me just read it for the purposes of, you know, uh, affirming it. The court said, and if the status quo is to be maintained pending the hearing and determination of the appeal, then it means the applicant would remain the chief and perform his functions until it has been decided otherwise. Go on, please. Perfect. Perfect. So mm -hmm. the rule still remains ex parte allotted. Nana Kupeko is an exception. It has not been followed by any court. It has not been overruled by any court. So if you follow it, it's at your own risk. We should also note that if you read the case of Liberty Press, the court says that contempt is a tool for the court to guard against its own powers. And as such, it should be exercised rightly. As we proceed, we discuss that contempt is of two forms, criminal contempt and civil contempt. Mm -hmm. For criminal contempt, the court exercises it only when there is an attempt to undermine the authority of the court. If I am a chief and I'm served an application for an injunction and I continue to remain a chief, that is not content. Now, because in that case, they brought these two main charges against the chief, that means by that very act, they are acknowledging the fact that he is a chief. So once he is a chief, he cannot be restrained by just an act of serving him with an application for an injunction. And the status quo at that time was that he was a chief. Right. Let me say, mm. There and is a clear distinguishing factor between that case and Mufat. And the court clearly indicated in Mufat, the person was yet to be outdoored as right. a chief. Mm. So the status quo at that time was that he was not a to chief. Be he had not been outdoored. Mm -hmm. So if you are served with an application for an injunction, maintain the status quo, don't outdoor him. So if you outdoor him, that amounts to contempt of court. Thank you. And Permit me to also refer you to the case of, well, just one more. Go the ahead. Versus Eha, the second and others, ex parte Togobo and others. This is also by the Court of Appeal. And it's reported in 2003-2005, one Ghana law report, 329. In that same case, decided after this case that we are discussing, mm -hmm. someone was served in an application for injunction to restrain himself and others from installing somebody as the a home fear of our law. They proceeded to install the person, and the court said that you are in contempt of court because you are aware that there's an application pending in court against you. So people should not quote crew as a rule. Crew is an exception. Ex parte alute is a rule. Right. And as you mentioned, and Bobby also uh, mentioned earlier, everything put aside, in this matter, the court also says you cannot say once the person is served, they should cease performing their job as a chief. Because if you look at the Chieftaincy Act, as you mentioned, and the court referred particularly to section 27 of the Chieftaincy Act, 
and and said that quote this is what the the provision says an appeal to the national house of chiefs or to a regional house of chiefs shall operate as a stay of execution of the judgment or other uh, or order appealed against and any order made consequentially upon it unless the appellate tribunal otherwise directs and the court said it is noted it is to be noted from this provision that even where a chief has been found liable on a charge to distool him the law says that if he decides to contest it on appeal he should go on to perform as a chief whilst the appeal is going on unless the appellate court or tribunal decides otherwise if in a situation where a chief has been found liable to distoolment charges the law permits him to continue to perform the functions of his office how can the mere filing of an application for interim injunction operate to restrain him from performing the functions of a chief thank you very much for the distinguishing uh, the difference in this and the allotte that you have made now we will go to the famous expertisito which other lawyers also have quoted and particularly the first ground that the court set out it said there must be a judgment or an order requiring the person and putting persons for the education of our our um, audiences because it refers to contaminol there must be a judgment or an order requiring the contaminol that is the person to do or abstain from doing something so if you file an application for injunction and you bring me a copy that is not an order that is not a judgment why are you saying if i don't stop what i'm doing i can be cited for contempt and i'll be held for contempt when this case says that to hold somebody for contempt the person you must first show that the person there's a judgment or there's an order that requires them to stop or not do something but which they have done well again um, every ratio must be read <laughs> in this contest mm. in the s party cito case mm. the application for contempt was not based on the fact that the respondent or the the, the contemnor had gone ahead to act or to do something when there was a pending application. That is the first a pending application for to restrain him from doing that one. Thank you. So in the S party CITO, the application had actually been heard and the person had been ordered to return the blacks to to a certain uh, family house. That's right. So at that point it was no longer a pending application. Mm -hmm. It was an order of a court. And so the ratio by this court there was not considering whether there was a pending application. If there was a pending application, I'm sure the judges would have expanded their ratio to cover it. We know in practice, you have times when Supreme Court gives a ratio, then it seems to be applied in a different context. Then they say, no, 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 because the facts were different. That is why we gave that ratio. So the first distinguishing factor is that the contempt that we've been discussing from last week, is contempt when there is a pending application restraining you to, from doing something which you go ahead to do. Right. But in the ex participio case, the application had been heard and the contempt law had been ordered to return the blacks to. Mm -hmm. Now, the, I believe the order was made sometime in 88 or 87. The person returned the blacks to in 1998. In that 10 year gap, the applicants did not complain. Yes. He didn't complain. He, he was happy with the status quo because when the court gives an order, you must enforce it. Mm -hmm. And if you do not enforce that order by any of the known means of enforcement, once the person complies with the order, the order has been discharged. So the court making that first rule that there must be an existing order sought to say that in the context of that case, there was no existing order. Mm -hmm. Because at the time you brought the application to commit them for contempt, they have discharged the order by complying with it, even though they only complied with it after 10 years of the order, when you did not take any step to enforce it. 
One thing that I also want to draw attention to is that that decision was, was in 2001. Right. You know that under the new rules, 2004, mm -hmm. the CI 47. That's right. If the court makes an order for you to do something, even if the court does not give timelines, mm -hmm. there's an automatic 14 days. That was absent in that law at that time. Mm. And so at that time, once the court said return the blacks to, without giving timelines, you, you the beneficiary of the order, had to enforce it mm -hmm. when you want, or it left the, the, the person to whom the order was directed to, to enforce it whenever, or to carry it out whenever he wanted, unless there's judicial force applied. Mm. Right. So the, 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 the statement by the Supreme Court in the CITO case, that to commit somebody for committal for contempt, there must be an order. Was, that statement is made in the context of the fact that at the time the application for con committal for contempt was brought in the CITO case, the respondents had already complied with that order. And so there was no longer an order that they had flouted. Mm -hmm. And so that is different from the scenario that we have been discussing where there is a pending application with straining you from doing something which you go ahead to do it. And for all the reasons that we have given that, it will mean that you are taking the law into your own hands right. and then denying the court. The and, and in the reference you make to the year for this case, mm -hmm. which is two, three years before we made the CI rules, CI-47, yes. which you have written about, in that context, mm -hmm. a judge of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. said, this is the kind of content that is the ex parte alote kind, which it says that is the position that has now been codified under Order 50 of CI 47. So I go back to Albert. Will you repeat that plainly? A lawyer will be misadvising or Ill, giving ill advice to their clients when they referred to this matter and said, the court has even said that for you to be punished for contempt is not when an application has been brought to you. It must be that you have seen an order and then you disobeyed it. What will you say? All right, so uh, contempt is in two forms. We have what is called criminal contempt. Right. And we have civil contempt. In the Mutia 3 case, the court said that criminal contempt is a criminal offense. And that was why the president could grant presidential pardon for persons who were convicted for criminal contempt. The court defines criminal contempt as all matters that bring the administration of justice into public ridicule and hatred or interfere with the administration of justice. That is criminal contempt. Civil contempt relates to disobedience of a lawful order of a court. So if you disobey a, an order of a court, it is civil contempt. Lawyers call it quasi-criminal right. because you can suffer imprisonment as a punishment. But criminal contempt is a crime and established as a crime under Article 1912 and Article 126. So once a court finds you guilty of a criminal contempt, you carry a criminal tag. Now, when an application is pending before a court for injunction and it is brought to your notice, and you, you disregard it and do the very act, you commit criminal contempt because you are doing an act that is to undermine the administration of justice, that is to bring the administration of justice into public radical. The case of ex parte sito does not border on criminal contempt. Ex parte sito borders on civil contempt. And like Bobby Bansi really stated, it has to do with an alleged order of a court which has been flouted. That has nothing to do with criminal contempt. The rules that we discussed last week and today border on criminal contempt at, uh, interfering with the administration of justice. The rules in ex parte sito does not apply. Ex parte sito is when someone alleges that an order of a court has been made, it has been brought to your attention, and you have flouted it. So that if you are only served with an application for an injunction and you go against it, the rules in ex parte sito does not apply, but the rules for general undermining the administration of justice, interfering with the course of justice will apply. And in my view, the punishment for that is much more heavier than that in civil disobedience. Because in civil disobedience, even, if, even though you can go to prison for it, the Supreme Court says it does not carry a criminal tag. 
But if you go to prison for criminal contempt, you are an ex-convict. That's right. You have a criminal record. Mm. And as such, it is much more serious to, to, to disregard an application for an injunction served on you, in my view, than to even disregard an order of a court which has been served on you. Because one carries criminal connotation, the other does not. So that is how I would situate the expertise sector case and should not be treated generally mm. Mm. as the rule on contempt because it borders only on civil contempt and not criminal contempt. Um, you raise a serious add. issue here. Mm. He raises a very serious issue here that will get people sitting up. Mm. That for not being patient to wait for a process to be exhausted and you proceed and if you are cited for contempt and you are held accordingly, you are carrying the tag of an ex-convict. Oh, yes. And all the restrictions that come with being an ex-convict in the Constitution or would, would apply to you. Because no matter how the process began, once a court finds, finds you guilty of that uh, um, charge, for lack of a better word, even though it arises from a civil action, you would, you, would, you, would, you, would, you would be in prison. I think at a point there was a challenge by, uh, um, I've forgotten the case, in the Supreme Court where the argument was that because of the consequences of this kind of contempt, it should only be commenced by the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court yes. said, yes, the Supreme Court mm. said, no, 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 because... As it, in Liberty Press. Yes, mm. it will arise from civil actions. You cannot bed in the Attorney General with all of these things. There are some that you would have criminal code provisions that the attorney general can take it upon himself. Mm -hmm. But if I am in a civil action against you and you find me, you, you, you bring an application for contempt, the court finds me guilty. The court sends me to jail. I, it is as if I have been put in jail. The same tag of a misdemeanor if you are put in jail with all the consequences that come with it is on my head. It's serious. Serious. You are I, going, I you're to, going to say something. And, and we're going to open the phone lines for you uh, shortly because I promised you that we'll do that very shortly we are going to do that so get ready any questions that you have ab about the discussion please don't go beyond it we're talking about injunctions that could lead to contempt injunction applications that could lead to you being found guilty of contempt and what all of that mean my guess will also share with you when you are found guilty of contempt um, what are the possible punishment or sanctions that you suffer we don't intend here on the show to scare you. <laughs> we are only giving you legal education. Thank you. <laughs> well, the, the CITO um, case, right. uh, I was saying that even the CI-47, mm -hmm. um, there's a provision, I believe, in under 44 or so, that situates this uh, first ratio or mm -hmm. first holding may be deemed to have seemed to have been modified by that provision. Right. There's, a, there's a Supreme Court decision, but there's more recent one by Justice than Jennifer Dazi. Okay. She is now at the Court of Appeal, but while she was sitting at the High Court, it's Ousu versus Ousu, Ousu and Ansa and something, where she clarified that position that these days, under CI 47, if there is an order of a court asking you to do something or restrain from doing something, and then you proceed to flout that order, the person who intends to cite you for contempt must serve you with a penal notice first. Mm. And I see that it's not very common practice, mm. but it's there. And they've started enforcing it. Because the penal notice is to let you know the seriousness of what you are doing. And that it is sort of a last warning, for lack of a better word. Mm. Because this time it is not a pending an appli application. It is an order of a court. So if you do not comply with the order of the court restraining you from doing something or asking you to do something, the other party is required, it is a shall, mm. to serve you with a penal notice that I am reminding you that this court made this order on this day and you are still flouting it. So mm -hmm. if you continue, mm -hmm. then I'll proceed to cite you for contempt. Mm. So if you still proceed after having been served with a penal notice, and the person files the application for contempt and attaches evidence of the service of the penal notice on you, then you have no excuse. Okay, so we will shortly get into what are the possible sanctions when you are found guilty of contempt 
uh, possible sanctions for disobeying, uh, for not waiting for an injunction uh, application to be heard. Um, Ahmed, you are online. Uh, you're calling from Tamale, is it? Hello? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What's your name? Ahmed Rupai from Tamale. Ahmed Mubarak, please go ahead with Rupai, your question. Okay. Yeah, uh, if you face somebody for contempt, why is in the process of performing that duty? You should have to stop or you have to continue the, this in the, uh, the program. That's my question. You said if you serve somebody with what? An application for committal contempt. for contempt? Yes, and it's in the process of performing that duty. So you have to stop or you have to continue the program. All right. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, the phone lines are now opened. Uh, actually, I think he called before we opened. <laughs> they are now <laughs> open. You can call and ask your question. You heard it. You heard yes. it. Yeah. Um, it's a very good question he mm. asked. Once mm. there is an application for committal for contempt, it's served on you, and there's evidence that you've actually engaged in that mm. act, some judges will rely on the common law principle that you must purge your contempt before you are even heard. Mm -hmm. It just shows you how serious it is that you don't even have a right to be heard in court until what you are being cited, committed for, if there is prima facie evidence, you have stopped it. So for instance, if you were restrained from um, going onto a land, and after you were served with the order and everything, you go and put your tractor or your car on the land, mm -hmm. and the committer for contempt, the affidavit shows that evidence, the court may decide not to even hear your opposition. And as you go and remove that car from that land, before you come to stand in court. That's what you mean by purging purge, yourself. By purge, okay. purging yourself of the contempt. So is that serious? Mm. That you must immediately cease and reverse what you have done if possible. Mm. Other than that, all those things may be factored in by the judge when he's passing his sentence. Okay. Richard, you are calling us from Obwasi. What's your question? Yeah, good afternoon, Samson. Afternoon. Yeah, my question is that uh, is there any difference on the injunction applications serve on the EC against the limited voter registration exercise, which they defied and went ahead with the exercise, as compared to the injunction application serve on the Democracy Hub, uh, during which they defied and the, uh, the police arrested them. Mm. The EC defied this injunction application. They were, they were served with uh, contempt. They practically dodged the, 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 the the service of the of the contempt, but similar group carried out the, um, a similar thing, and they were arrested. I think there is a selective justice here, okay. and it's a danger uh, to all right. To, uh, Thank uh, you. Democracy. Thank you for your question, Richard. But as we we announced last week, we are unable to answer directly to the question of the EC situation because, as you already know. The EC has admitted that they have been served with the uh, court processes, as in injunction processes, and the EC, through their lawyers, have actually written to the lawyer for those who are uh, in court to receive processes. And we understand it's injunction and also contempt. So let's allow the court to deal with that. Um, I'd like uh, Bobby to share briefly on the prohibit prohibition application served on the uh, Occupy Jilobi House people. That one is <laughs> over. There's nothing pending in court. Mm. So we can yeah, do that. I think that. they've withdrawn the... Yeah, it's, said, I read somewhere this. All right. The police said they've um, withdrawn the injunction. But, but first, let's hear Lizzie. Uh, Lizzie, you are calling from Teshi. Let's hear you. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, please, I want to find out if there is a case in court. There has been a judgment already and immediately after the judgment, there was an appeal. Can the person go on with whatever was the uh, judgment was moved for? Or we have to hold on for the appeal to uh, end before any process can happen? Okay, so uh, when the appeal was filed, yes. have there been any other processes? There's a particular mm -hmm. process called stay of uh, execution. No, please. Nothing like that has been filed? Yes, yes, please. All right, thank you very much. So, please, so, when the person continues, uh, does that amount to contempt or... All right, thank you. Thank you. So, let's start from Lizzie. Yes, um, like uh, when we were discussing the um, case, we, mm. we said that um, in civil procedure or practice, 
the filing of a notice of appeal does not mean that the judgment that you're appealing against should be suspended or stayed unless the judgment debtor, that is the person who lost the case, specifically goes to the court to make an application that the, the judgment should be stayed. And if that application for stay of execution is served on you, mm -hmm. and you proceed to execute the judgment, you will be in contempt. Okay. Because the application for stay of execution, just like the other applications for injunctions you are discussing, means that your hands are tied until a court determines that pending application itself. So if, if, if there's a judgment in your favor and the other party has only served you with a notice of appeal but has not filed an application for stay of execution or depending on the circumstance, if there's an executable order, injunction pending appeal, then you are allowed to go ahead and execute your judgment until right. you are served with that notice. So Lizzie, the advice to you is that there is nothing stopping you from enjoying the fruits of your judgment. There's an appeal against the judgment that you have gotten. The person who has appealed must go forward to file another process that stops you from enjoying the fruits of your judgment. Otherwise, there's nothing wrong. You cannot be cited for contempt. Um, um, Albert, you are calling from official town, or Doko. Let's hear you, Albert. Yes. Uh, my question is, uh, the case with regards to Mr. Peter White uh, is contempt case. Which case? Uh, Which case? Uh, Mr. Peter White. Uh, Mr. Peter White. I, I don't know about it. He was, uh, he was set for contempt. Ah, all right, all right, all right. Uh, I get it. Yeah. And uh. you see that he was called before the court. Mm -hmm. And the court initially, he was convicted. The court convicted him, but later he was pardoned. So I want to I want to find out whether that case uh, whether that conviction aspect is still stands or because it was pardoned he can maybe go ahead and later maybe going forward he can buy for a position. That's I, my question, please. I hear. Thank you very much for your question. We had a question pending from Richard in Obwasi, and we said we couldn't deal with the EC matter, mm. but at least the one with the police prohibition mm. matter. So his question is straightforward. Mm. The police filed it. Mm. And if we agree that the police had served the Occupy uh, Democracy Hub people, mm. could they have been gone there to do what they were doing, uh, even though they denied that they were served? Yes. Mm. So for me, that whole yeah. matter depends on the evidence of the service, probably right. so-called. Mm. But if indeed they were served with a notice for injunction, I believe that they would have been required not to proceed with the injunction on that day. And it right. will not be something strange. The minority, when they originally intended to proceed on the mm -hmm. Occupy Bank of Ghana, which is coming on this coming uh, tomorrow? No, this week. Yes, I know it's, it's, sometime it's this, this week. week yeah. that, I'll, I'll confirm the yes, date. Yes, <laughs> I'm not advertising. This is a legal <laughs> clinic. Uh, it's yes, a legal so, clinic. It's not for the so, politics. Yes, yes. So, mm. um, they, when they were served with the injunction application mm. by right. the police, mm. they did not go ahead. They then went back to court mm -hmm. to go to that process. So, That's it is right. not as if it is something new that is being said. If indeed the police filed it and served them, mm then the democracy hub would have been required by right. law. The, the, the major it. concern, and let me flip that to Albert. I understand Albert is uh, back on. We lost you momentarily. Um, the, the, the flip side of that is, the major concern of that is, if they were indeed served by the police, the two of you have agreed that once you are served, you don't take a step. Now, if they were indeed served and they took the step, was the police right in their approach? Because the police issued a letter saying that they are enforcing the application. Yes, Albert. All right, so um, my view is that under the Public Order Act, once the police feel that for some reasons you cannot have the demonstration, they serve you with the notice, then they are supposed to report back to the police indicating whether you comply with it or not. Once you indicate that you are not complying with it, then the police will have to go to court to apply money. That is what the law is We have given further information to the effect that once you are served with the until otherwise determined, 
So I will make my argument on the backdrop that they were indeed saved as the police indicates. Now, once you are saved, then that means the demonstration that you are embarking upon is contrary to public order. Because now there is an injunction to restrain you. I've heard arguments of people saying that, why don't you allow them to embark on the demonstration? Then thereafter, you cite them for contempt. One thing we are supposed to know is that the police is responsible for the protection of public property. They are responsible for public order, public security, and for peace. And as such, the police should not fold them their hands for anything wanting to happen. And thereafter, they proceed to, to court for, for contempt. In that circumstance, their statement said that their statement said that they were enforcing that application. <laughs> no, the police do not have the power. For that, I would disagree. The police do not have the power to enforce um, contempt for and on behalf of the court. There are even if it's criminal contempt, like I explained, it is mm. only the attorney general or the court so motu that can invite the people for contempt. If it right. is civil disobedience, the police will cite the organizers for contempt. Mm. But I feel if the argument had been mm. that the police were maintaining public order or for the safety and security of the people and property in the area, mm. then I feel that they will have a right basis for doing so. But the police is not mandated to enforce uh, 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 contempt or right. to enforce... The, the, next, the next question, we have very limited time now. Uh, as I prompted you ahead, so what are the consequences if you are found guilty of contempt of the court? So there are, there are several um, possible scenarios. If it is, depending on the nature of the contempt. contempt. Mm -hmm. So there are some contempts that are in the face of the court. You are in the courtroom, you do something, you see, for example, you are not allowed to record court proceedings. So if you go to courtroom with your phone and you record court proceedings, that is contempt of court. Mm. And the court, the judge there and then has seen you, has doing, seen it. you doing it. Mm. The judge can decide to imprison you, ask you to go in for three days, five days, or caution you, let you sign a bond to be of good behavior. If, it's, if the contempt arises out of a civil action, the court has an obligation or has two options, either to grant the application or dismiss the application for contempt. If the court dismisses it, it means you are not guilty. That's if right. the court grants it, the court can now has the discretion to decide the kind of punishment. Mm -hmm. Like I said, in the COVID times, there was a general policy not to put people behind bars because of the prison content. But that's, that's we know true. that depending on how the court thinks that, for example, if you were served with a penal notice and you still went ahead to do, mm. the court will think that, okay, you have decided just to disrespect the court. The court may decide to put you in prison or order you to pay a fine, or just a mere caution. So it's all at the discretion of the judge. Mm. In, in, in some of the cases, and, and the, I think one caller made reference to uh, Tessa White's case, mm. if you are lucky, and the court suomotu says that you've said something on air that is disparaging or against the um, 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 dignity of the court, mm -hmm. if the court convicts, convicts you of contempt, the conviction alone makes you guilty of contempt. Mm. You're an ex-convict. Once the court convicts you, you're an ex-convict. Mm. After the conviction, the court may decide not to even put you in jail. That is sentencing. Right. So you can be convicted mm. and not sentenced to in prison. But that does not take away the fact that you're an ex-convict. So that if the court thinks that you have appeared before them, you have learned your lesson, I think Sir John, it happened to Sir mm -hmm. John, Mm -hmm. They will decide to drop, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. drop their charges. So whatever they would have achieved just to let you know that they exist and they have the power to commit for contempt would have been achieved. But once there is the conviction, and even if there is no sentencing, mm -hmm. it still becomes an ex-convict. Okay. So it could be from a fine, uh, a bond to be a good be behavior, or prison sentence. Right. And that brings us to the question that Somebody had asked, and I think we, we hadn't dealt with that, the, the Pesa White yes. one. So in that case, he had appeared before the court and initially pleaded not guilty. Mm. Then later, he changed his, his plea <laughs> to guilty with explanation. Mm. Then he changed it again mm. to guilty simplicity, mm. that I'm guilty. Mm. Once he did that, the court convicted him on his own plea of guilt. Mm. Remember, before he appeared before the court, 
he has sought to do what you said, purge himself mm. of the contempt. Mm. Issued statements he saying that he didn't intend to and he would never do such a thing right. So the court convicted him on his own plea, but the court decided not to sentence him. Correct? Mm. Right. Uh, following his apology and retraction. Mm. The court therefore had mercy uh, on him. There were mitigation mm. things put in mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. The question the guy was asking is, does that make him an ex-convict which disables him from taking, you know, like the offices or positions where the law says you mean you should not have been a convict i want to think so <laughs> because that was okay. criminal contempt yes that was criminal contempt and you have explained together with jenfi yes. that criminal contempt once you are found guilty it is like yes all right you've been charged mm -hmm. especially when especially when those offenses mm -hmm. are, are put in such a you know, or are described in the constitution in a manner that your actions are deemed, I think there was some morality, offense of morality, things like that that have, that have been mentioned there. So I, I want to think so. Without, without the benefit of the full facts sitting here, I want to think that once he was convicted on that criminal contempt that was initiated by the court itself, right. then he may, he may be deemed to have been an ex-convict on grounds of offenses that may border on those lines that restricts his public okay. office to, 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 to a large extent. So listen to him carefully, May yeah. and May. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Uh, unfortunately, Albert's line keeps dropping and just dropped a while ago. Albert Jemfi is a law lecturer and also an author of legal texts. Bobby Banson right here in the studio is a law lecturer and author of legal texts on civil procedure in Ghana. We were dealing with, we dealt with, um, give you education on injunctions, how to avoid contempt of court. This has been part two. I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. This has been the law. It's your legal lights. It's your health law. Join us again next time for an interesting legal clinic. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>